الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد Once again everyone Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh Today's goal inshallah is to cover uh, some lessons and reflections from Surah An-Naba and we will go in that order every evening for the next five evenings tonight and uh, you know all the way up until Friday to try to get to Surah Al-Infitar. These are surahs number 78 to 82 of the Quran for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, Juz Amma, which is what this is, this portion of the Quran is famously called, is very special to me for a number of reasons. One of them is uh, Bayina kind of started with Juz Amma. I used to teach these durus, um, maybe 2003, 2004, in, and I started in Maryland. Uh, I was there for a little while, and when I started that series there, I would do one, one podcast a week and in the Gaithersburg community, and then it you know, kind of went from there, and those podcasts, which were just literally my phone as a recorder, um, then became podcasts and became viral, and then like, the servers went down, so many downloads where the servers went down and like I, I met people from all over the world that were listening to that stuff uh, from way back then, subhanAllah. And that was also the makings of the Bayina Dream program, our campus. I used to do these podcasts and ask people if they'd like to help me build a campus. And um, just from those podcasts, the original Bayina campus came into being. And then we, we discontinued that and you know, the, the campus had been running on its own. Alhamdulillah, we have a building of our own now. It's a, it's a long story, but uh, I did want to share with you that this is actually when I decided that I'm going to make a shift in my career. This is around 2003, 2004 time. Up until then, my focus was on teaching Arabic and studying the Quran as I could get a chance. And that's when I decided I'm going to focus at least 50% of my efforts into teaching Quran. 50% on the Arabic side, 50% on the Quran side. And Alhamdulillah, now that I've come back for you at, and at this occasion, pretty much um, my entire work is Quran study now. I've passed on the Arabic teaching to my students who, who have now become teachers, and the curricula have been standardized the way that I developed them, and even further enhanced by them, and very grateful for them. And so that's given me an opportunity to become a full-time Quran student. And as a result of that, some of the things that I studied so many years ago, I'm re-studying. I'm going back and looking at the same suwar that I did so many years ago. And one of the weird things I have to do for these durus is listen to myself from 12 years ago or 15 years ago. And it's very awkward listening to yourself. You should try it sometime. It's a psychological torture. Um, from the, 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 how nasal you sound and how sometimes I listen to myself and say, wow, I used to be really smart. What happened to me? And then other times I say, how was I this dumb? <laughs> so, so that's been an interesting adventure also. But there are other studies and other, uh, other in, uh, you know, developments in the field of the study of the Qur'an that I've been made more familiar with. And I hope to introduce you to some of those things as we progress also. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that this series is now a, a group effort. So I come and present, but I am a student among other peers. So we actually at Bayina now have a research group. Uh, there are a group of us that study Qur'an together. We take different assignments within the study of the same surah. Some people work on just the vocabulary of the surah, other work, others work on comparative tafsir, other work, others work on textual analysis, etc., etc., and even some biblical subtext. And we kind of put that all together, and that informs a lot of these lectures. So this is actually a group effort, and I'd like to acknowledge you know, Sheikh Suhaib and his team for the work that do, do, do you guys may not know Sheikh Suhaib Saeed, he's, uh, he's in Scotland. And so he works remotely from there, and, which is why I sneak off to Europe every now and then just to catch up with him and catch up on some studies. In any case, so we begin with Surah Al-Naba today. One of the things I'd like to share with you about the, the style of Makkan Quran is that it's very rhythmic. It's very, you know, it sounds blasphemous to say musical, but it's, it's actually very, like the, the, the tonality of it, when you listen to recitation of it, is very, very powerful. As a matter of fact, even if a non-Muslim listened to it, they'd start getting a, like a buzz out of it. How, how incredible it is and how, how captivating it is. Okay, so the, 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 the audible quality of these surahs is very, very powerful. And that actually plays a role in the message of the surah as well. You know, when, when we experience, when we study the Qur'an now, pretty much the Qur'an to us is a book, right? So you're reading a book. And for most of us, we're reading it in translation. But that's not how the original audience of the Qur'an experienced the Qur'an. They heard sounds. They heard words. There was no paper in front of them. 
It wasn't a silent experience. It was a lived experience, right? And so a lot of the power of the message of the Qur'an is often hard to capture when you translate. And that's especially true of the Qur'an from Mecca. This is some of the earlier revelations of the Qur'an, shorter surahs, shorter ayat, very poetic and, and you know, picturesque in nature, and they move quickly. It's rapid fire, right? And, and that kind of power, that kind of poetic power, uh, and it's far beyond poetry, and that's one of the things that baffled the Arabs of the time. That kind of power is very difficult to capture in translation. So one of our tasks is also going to be to try to understand how these ayat are flowing, and what's, what's, what's going on with them. So I'll, I'll begin now with a little bit of background. You have to understand people that are called, the Qur'an calls them al-mukathibin. Al-mukathibin. And that's actually a subject from the surah right before this one. وَيْلٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ the worst destruction shall fall upon this group of people Allah calls al-mukaddibin. Who are they? These are people who heard the message of Islam. They were exposed to the Quran. They were exposed to the Prophet ﷺ. They found the arguments convincing. It's not like they didn't find the arguments convincing. But they didn't want to accept it. So they had a number of reactions. Either they called the Prophet a liar. Or they called the Quran a lie. Or they dismissed it altogether. Or, and it's one thing to not believe something. It's another to call somebody else a liar. Look, if I'm trying to convince you of something and you're not convinced, then you haven't done anything against me. You just didn't agree with me and you walk away. But if I'm convincing you of something and you not only are you not convinced, or even if you are convinced, how do you respond? By making allegations against me. Now you're on the offense. You're not just some neutral party, you're on the offense. You're trying to undermine either my character, or what I'm trying to say, or you're trying to you know, humiliate me before others, hey, don't listen to him, he's a liar. So you, now you're, it's not just between you and I, you've basically created a campaign against myself. Mukaddibun in the Qur'an are the people who made a campaign against the Prophet ﷺ. And they're also described as the people who did takdeeb of previous prophets. These people are campaigning against the message of truth. Okay? Now one of the forms of takdeeb is what we're going to come across in the very beginning of this beautiful surah. Allah Azza wa says, Amma yatasa'alun. About what are they asking each other? Anin naba il azim? About the great event? Now to ask one another, let's stop there first. Tasa'ul comes from the Arabic word su'al. Urdu speakers call it sawal. Right? Su'al in Arabic, the, the verb sa'ala, to ask a question, does two things. It could be su'al al istifham. It could be you ask someone to try to understand something. Like a question. When you ask somebody a question, you're looking for information, you're looking for understanding. Simple enough. But there's also su'al al-istihza. There's also a question meant as sarcastic commentary. Like, you know, when the youth here will understand. Somebody says something, you're like, seriously? Question mark? And when you say it like that, you're not actually asking seriously, you're saying you're really not very intelligent at all, and you know. And so sometimes the way you ask a question, are you for real? You know? And when you, when you do that, you're, po you're putting down somebody. Is that really the best you can do? That's not really a question, is it? Is that the best you got? That's not a question, that's an insult. And so sometimes questions are asked for the purpose of diminishing somebody else's speech, commentary, you know, to, to make them feel belittled. These are psychological tactics. You see, and this is an important part to, uh, an opportunity to mention this, because we are in the midst of media propaganda. All kinds of things are being said about Islam from all kinds of voices in all kinds of ways. So especially for the young here, you need to understand something called logical fallacies. This is going to help you a lot in life. Logical fallacies are when people are arguing for or against something, in our case most of the time Islam, they are going to use tactics that are very powerful but they're not fair. You won't even realize that, it's, that basically they're cheating an argument. It's basically cheating. You know, it's like the guy that came into a boxing match with bricks inside his glove or something. You know, they have an unfair advantage. And these advantages, they're not rational, they're not reasonable, you know, based on reason, they're emotional tactics. To give you an example, if I was to have a debate with a, you know, a, 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 maybe a member of the Christian faith, even though I don't believe in debate, but hypothetically, I'm sitting on a table and we're discussing something about Jesus or something. Obviously, we have different points of view. And we're having this conversation in the church. And the vast majority audience sitting before us is a Christian congregation 
who love their pastor, who I'm talking to, every time he speaks and he finishes his point, what do you hear in the crowd? You hear a standing ovation. Every time I speak, even before I get to finish what I'm saying, what do you hear? You hear boos and howling and get out of here and whatever. And that already makes it sound like what I'm saying is offensive and what the other saying is valid. But actually the opposite is also true. If, if that same conversation was happening and there was an excited Muslim audience instead of a Christian audience, every time I made a point, Takbir! And every time he made a point, Astaghfirullah! Or something. If that happened, that's still not fair. Because the arguments are no longer being weighed by how rational are they, how valid are they, how reasonable are they. Now the crowd is a kind of validation. The crowd is saying this argument makes more sense, that argument makes less sense, you understand? And psychologically in the mind of anybody who's listening, look at that guy, he got booed off stage, he doesn't know what he's talking about. In other words, that's actually a logical fallacy, to use a crowd. Similarly to, you know, somebody makes a point and you don't have an answer, but you, you do this instead. <laughs> When you do that, what have you just said? What you said is so ridiculous and so stupid, it doesn't even deserve a response. All I can say is, <laughs> that's your response. It made it seem like you're far more intelligent than the argument presented, but the truth of it was you didn't have an answer. You just got stumped. And that's what happens in, the, that's a logical fallacy. This is the kind of stuff that's used against prophets. This is the kind of stuff you, you'll see in political debates. It's not even just used in Islamic discourse. It's used in political debates. The way somebody looks at somebody, the way somebody laughs at them. Quran will mention it. You know, they'll make you fall with the way they stare at you when they hear the Quran. Like, just that. Uh, that's enough for somebody to say, yeah, that must be ridiculous. And th so one of those logical fallacies is to actually turn the claim that's being made into sarcastic questions. Seriously? Afterlife? Yeah, so what is heaven like again? Oh, so there's hell, huh? How, what, is, what does it burn from? What, what do you get for food? And it must be, everything must be cooked already, so... What do you get there? You know, like people are just asking sarcastic questions about heaven, about hell, about resurrection, about the grave, you know, about the day of judgment. Oh, so there are books here, huh? How, how big are they? What's, that's a lot of ink, man. Where do you store it? Is there backup drive in case something happens? Is there uh, you know, cloud service? Qu sarcastic questions. There, there, so there are people asking all kinds of sarcastic questions to diminish what is actually to be, being claimed. Because early Quran came and basically made a very tall, very powerful statement. Human beings are on a journey. And their journey did not begin when they were born. Islam came and said that your journey began, began many, 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 many years ago. As a matter of fact, your journey began at the same time as when Adam salam was created. All of the arwah, all of you and I were created. And we were actually asked by Allah, if Allah asked us directly, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your master? We all responded, of course you are. That's when our journey began. We all knew Allah. And then what Allah decided was, He would take one of those souls, for lack of better words in English, and he would decide to take an angel and deliver that into the bellies of their mothers at a certain point during the pregnancy. And that would be the second part of our journey. From being in the company of Allah to inside the stomach of our mothers. And our, the third part of our journey would be when ثُمَّ السَّبِيلَ yassara, which we'll read later on, we would come out of our moms and our life in this world would begin. Our life didn't begin when we were born out of our mothers. Our life began much before then. Our physical body, yes, it started then. And then we're in this life, but that's not the end of, death is not the end of our journey. Death is actually the next important stop. And then begins a life that's going to be the life of questioning. The life of being accountable for what we did in this life. What we did in this, in this interim period. And that's going to be the life that many people will spend inside their graves. And from, them, then, from there the next, next you know, phase will begin. When Allah will command, and everyone who's left alive will also die, and then another time it will be blown into, the horn will be blown into, and everyone will be raised again, all, of create, all humanity will be raised again, will be brought back to life, even though we're decayed for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, 
And when we all come back together, then Allah will question every single human being for how they live their life. They'll, all of their deeds will be judged, and then there are only two conclusions, two destinations to go. It's either eternal heaven or eternal hell. Those are the two destinations. These are pretty powerful statements to make, because now you're saying human beings, you know, be asked, where did I come from? Where am I going? It's answering that question, isn't it? What is the meaning of life? You know, what does my life amount to? These are, these are the, the oldest questions in philosophy. And the Quran is claiming it has the answer to those questions. That's not a small thing. It's something that virtually every philosopher, every society, every religion in the world tries to answer this question. What is the meaning of life? What is gonna happen after we die? Is that all it was? And for some, we just blend into nature. We become one with nature. Some believe we come back as cockroaches or cats or dogs. Some others believe we don't come back at all. We're done. Some others, you know, they, 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 you know we're, or we're eternal or we become part of God or whatever other philosophies there are. There's so many views. And so when the surah begins, Amma yatasa'alun, what are they asking about? It's actually one of those views is the view Allah presented. What's the view that Allah presented? There is in fact a day on which everything you did in this life is going to be brought back to you. Not just you'll be brought back to life. Everything you did is on record and it's going to be questioned about. What that does is that it's of all the options that are out there, this is like the hardest one. Like of all the theories you could give me of an afterlife, the one that makes, that scares me the most is the one where I'll be interrogated and nothing I did went unrecorded. Everything was under surveillance. And so it's hard to swallow that one. It's hard to accept that one. And we'll see later on in the surah, I'll, I'll break the mystery now. ma'aba. It's actually those who don't want to listen to any rules. People who want to just do what they want to do. Like we say in, mod, in, in modern language now, just let me live my life, man. Just let me live how I want to live. I don't want to listen to anybody. Just leave me alone. I just want to be free. Those people are most agitated by the notion of a, of a day of resurrection. They're, they're most disturbed by it. So when Allah begins, عَمَّا يَتَسَأَلُونَ عَنِ النَّبَعِ الْعَظِيمِ Are they really dare, daring to ask questions about the great event? The great Naba? You know, they say in, uh, in English, Naba can mean news. The, in Arabic, in Quran, there are two kinds of news. There's khabar and Naba. And khabar is for small things. Khabar could be, Hey, I'm lost. Can you give me some khabar how to get to this town? That's khabar. Like Musa alayhi salam says, لَعَلِّي آتِيكُم مِّنْهَا بِخَبَر أَوْ أَجِدُ عَلَى النَّارِ هُدَى Maybe I'll go there and I will bring some news to you. Meaning small matters, okay? But on big matters, when something major, like an army is approaching, an earthquake is coming, the floods have washed away town. That's not just a khabar. That is what? That's naba. That's a big deal. So by using the word Naba, it's already a big deal. And then Allah makes it even a more grand deal by saying the word al azim The other thing about Naba is it's something that demands action. Khabar could be anything. Khabar could be, you know, a cat has four legs, is khabar. Now what do I do with that? Nothing, I just wanted to let you know. But when you say Naba, Naba means it's a major, like the city's being evacuated, there's a flood coming, or there's a tsunami coming, and Houston's being evacuated, or New York was being evacuated during the hurricane season, then it's not just, that's interesting, I'm gonna head to the beach. No, you go the other way. You have to take action when you hear Naba. By using the word Naba, Allah is actually calling on people that are laughingly talking about something they should be taking very seriously. Anin Naba. And then al azim adds another dimension to the word. It's not just great. Azum in Arabic or Ivam in Arabic actually means bone. Also means something solid or unbreakable. Something very stern. Something that remains intact. In other words, Allah is describing an event that's not just great, an event that is set. You can't change it. It's not just your view or your, your opinion will change the reality of what's coming. I'll tell you just by, by analogy, I like to talk a lot. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you by analogy. If there's a, a thunderstorm coming, you're a preference. I hate thunderstorms. God, I don't want it to come. That won't change anything. It's still coming. You can, you can cry about it. You can complain about it. But you can't change reality. It's set already. It also creates the notion, that the use of the word creates the notion that the afterlife, the thing Allah is talking about, this resurrection that Allah is talking about, is, is something tangible. It's not just a philosophical state of mind. For some fluffy versions of 
after notions of afterlife, you know, after we're, we're dead, we're just going to be the, these like ghost-like creatures that go through walls, Casper style back in the day, you know, and there, there's not really going to be anything tangible. You know, there's no physical heaven. It's just a state of mind. Heaven is not a state, it's a state of mind. Uh, no, it's, it's a state. It's a pretty tangible place. And that all of these notions are encapsulated inside an naba al azim And so then Allah says, الَّذِي هُمْ فِيهِ مُخْتَلِفُونَ which is an adjective of the previous. For those of you that are familiar with Arabic, what does this all mean? About which they have been in disagreement for a long time. Mukhtalifun is an ism suggesting they've, this is not a new disagreement. These people have had multiple views for many, many generations. They haven't resolved this issue for a very, very long time. But the question is, why are they talking about it now? Like they know that they have different views. That's not a new thing. And Allah is by, in this ayah also saying, they've held those various views forever and ever. Why is it that they're asking themselves now? And now Allah, by doing that, Allah is saying, that's because you're being sarcastic and condescending and obnoxious. That's why you're talking about it now. Because you're not serious. You know, this is Allah taking somebody acting, you know, uh, to, again, analogy. In a classroom, students ask questions for two reasons. One, they don't know. Two, they're being a smarty pants. When they, don't, when they want to be smart about something, they're like, I have a question. You know, I think uh, the other teacher's smarter than you. What do you think? That kid needs a whooping. Even if by words. You know, because you can go to jail for the whooping. Pakistan is okay. Over here, you go to jail, right? <laughs> Not two generations ago, I spoke to teachers from two generations ago, it was fine. But now you can't discipline children physically, right? Not that I believe in it entirely either. But the idea is I've had, I ha, I've had my share, because I was in, in Saudi school, in Pakistani school, so I've had my share of, you know, sunnah. So, <laughs> so <laughs> but the point is, when Allah sees them asking obnoxious questions about the afterlife, He gets offended and says, oh, oh, so now you're asking questions, like you're, you really want to know. All this time you've had all these different views and you didn't bother to disagree with each other. You just, you believe what you believe, I believe what I believe. And this one view comes into the mix and everybody's offended and everybody wants to chime in and throw in their view. Why? Because this one view doesn't say, oh, you can believe what you want, we'll believe what we want, it's all good. Quran comes and challenges everything that's out there. Ja'al haqq wa zahaq al batil. It doesn't just sit around and say, oh, oh, so you don't believe in an afterlife? Congratulations. That's really good. We do. Bye. No. It says, why don't you believe? Bring your evidences. Quran verbally, not physically, verbally picks a fight. Quran doesn't sit quiet. Quran doesn't just say, oh, you have your way, I have my way. It's okay. People quote the ayah, lakum dinukum waliya deen. You have your deen, I have my deen, it's all good. Actually, that ayah started with, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ Disbelievers. The, every time a prophet addresses his nation, he says, Ya qawmi, my, my people. That surah begins not, Qul ya qawmi, it begins what? Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun. In other words, he is not their nation anymore. He's making hijrah. Now I am not going to make da'wah to you anymore. You have your religion, I have mine. I'm going. That's what that surah was about. It's not about, no, 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 you can, you can worship whatever you want, and I'll just worship whatever I want, it's okay, just leave one corner of the Kaaba free from idols, I'll just make my salat there and we'll be fine. No. The Qur'an came and challenged. This deen came and challenged. It is offensive. Qur'an, I will, I will be the first to tell you. I've been trying to study the Qur'an for a long time now. I'll be the first to tell you. Qur'an, when it comes to other views of God, other views of afterlife, other views of purpose of life, is offensive. The Qur'an is not defensive. God speaks with authority, as only He can. I don't have that authority. I'm a slave. Messengers himself, themselves don't have that authority. They're slaves of Allah. But Allah speaks with authority. There's a grandeur and a power in Allah's words. And when people make fun of what He's saying, then He goes after them in His word. What, what did you just say? What are you asking about? What, what, what did they dare ask each other about? About the, about the great event? The one they've been in disagreement with all, about, about all this time? Kalla sayalamun. No, 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 no. They're going to find out soon. Kalla in Arabic means two things. Kalla, when you stop at it, means no, not at all. 
Kalla means no, 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 no. Absolutely not. Would like, if you were texting somebody Kalla, it would be capital N, capital O, and lots of exclamations. Or, or lots of O's in your nose. Like, no. Next time you can just say Kalla. Okay? <laughs> That's what Kalla is. But if you say Kalla in flow, without stopping, if you say Kalla sayalamun, we don't say Kalla sayalamun. We don't do that. We say what? Kalla sayalamun. We say it in flow. When you say it in flow, it actually has the opposite meaning. In other words, that no becomes absolutely. And let me tell you, that's not just an Arabic thing. It's in virtually every language. Oh no, I'm going to tell you, all right. Oh no, boy, you're going to get it. No. When you say no and then say something, sometimes it doesn't mean no. It means, oh yeah. That's what that means. It's a very emotional form of speech. You don't write or speak normally like this. You speak like this when you're angry or upset. This is Allah speaking. To those who ask sarcastic questions about resurrection and says, Kalla sayalamu, no, 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 they're gonna find out pretty soon. Oh, they will know all right. Thumma kalla sayalamu, no, no, then again I tell you, they will know. Mufassirun looked at these two ayat and said, maybe Allah is emphasizing here. That's why he said it twice. Kalla sayalamu, thumma kalla sayalamu. And these powerful words, sometimes, you know, when I hear you know, qira'at uh, of these, these uh, ayat, I get really confused. Because we have kids reciting Surah An-Naba, and they're so cute, and they're so soft in their voice. They're saying, Kalla sayalamun, thumma kalla sayalamun. And we're like, ah, so... <laughs> but this is so heavy. This is kalla sayalamun, thumma kalla sayalamun. Again, by analogy, things are known when a child is misbehaving in class and the teacher says, no, 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 you, end of class. No, 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 end of the school day. That kid, his life is already over. He's having flashbacks of all the good moments in his life. Because it's going to come to an end. When the bell rings, his bell is going to ring. You know, that's what's going to happen. That's what's happening in kalla sayalamun thumma kalla sayalamun. Allah did not respond intellectually to their argument. Allah did not take every one of their views and said, here's why this one is wrong, here's why this one is wrong, here's why this one is wrong. That would be a rational response. But they did not pose a rational question. They posed, you know, the, the sarcastic questions. And they don't deserve a rational response. So Allah doesn't give one. They were being condescending, they need to be put in their place. So Allah responded in a way that puts them in their place. The Qur'an is not a book of pure logic. The Qur'an is not a science textbook. The Qur'an is a conversation between Allah and people. Sometimes it's between Allah and prophets. Sometimes between Allah and believers. Sometimes between Allah and hypocrites. Sometimes between Allah and the worst of disbelievers. And Allah will take care of them too. He'll talk to them directly too. It's not just a sweet conversation between a believer and his Rabb. It's with all of humanity. Allah speaks with all of humanity. And so He decides to change the subject. For those who really seek to think, where did this idea of afterlife come from? Where did this idea, why should I believe in judgment day? What argument can you give me, God? That's when the next passage begins. And this passage, when you first read it, you'll feel like, doesn't seem related at all. It's like a completely different subject. My job, how much time is before Maghrib? How much time? Fif 15 minutes? Okay, so let me see if I can hopefully summarize that part of the argument for you in a, in a consistent way before, before the Maghrib break. I'll read some of these ayat to you first and, and translate them briefly before explaining. Here's the second. So the first passage was about their obnoxious question and how Allah says, that, oh, they'll know. Pretty soon they're going to realize. Now, uh, one thing I didn't mention, I should mention about that last passage is, you know how there's two times the question? There are three threats in the Qur'an. Please don't forget that. The, if you study the entire Qur'an, there are three kinds of threats, three kinds of warnings. The first warning is, nation, if you don't listen to your prophet, you're going to be destroyed. That was the warning given to the people of Nuh, Lut, 
Salih, Shu'ayb alayhim salam, Fir'aun, you name it, those were the people that were given warnings, if you don't listen, your nation shall be destroyed, right? That's the first kind of threat in the Qur'an. The second kind of threat is what will happen to people on Judgment Day, okay? The death, by the way, is not a threat, because death is a reality. That's not, I'm not threatening you one day you'll die, like, thanks, I already knew that. That's not a threat. So the first threat is destruction of nations. The second threat is Judgment Day, where you will be held accountable, where you will be brought to trial. The trial is the threat. The third threat in the Qur'an is hell. So there's three, destruction of nations. What else did I say? Let me hear it from you. Day of Judgment and then hell. Now, the thing about destruction of nations is do people know when it's coming? No. وَلَيَأْتِيَنَّهُمْ بَغْتَةً وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ It will come to them all of a sudden and they'll have no realization. The mercy of Allah is that our messenger was the last messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with him ended the destruction of nations. There is no more destruction of nations. That's done. Okay, so that's a mercy from Allah Azza wa Jal that that door of threat closed forever. The last time those threats were issued, they were issued to Quraysh. That's it. There's no more that one nation will be completely annihilated or wiped out or whatever else, okay? So when they see, especially, see a flood happen in some country and see Allah ka azab de khuzra, shame on you. That's not what Quran says. That's what your, you know, Pindu interpretation was. You need to stop doing that. That is a test from Allah, not a adab of Allah. We don't say that's a adab from Allah, that's a, that's a torture from Allah. We don't say that, okay? Now, anyway, so there were three threats. One of them comes to people, they have no clue. They have no clue what's going on. An earthquake came, a flood came, nobody even knows what's happening, and all of a sudden they're done, isn't it? But if you look at these ayat, kalla sayalamun thumma kalla sayalamun, they will know. Oh yeah, they will know. Which means there are two punishments where people will what? They will know. I told you how many threats are there? Three. But one of them, people won't even know what's happening. Which is which one? Destruction of nations. What, what, are, what are the two left? Day of judgment? Hellfire. When judgment day begins, people are terrified. Oh, and then they know, Oh my God. This is... And حَاضِرًا They will find everything they did standing in front of them. They will know. But even that isn't knowing until they see hell. Because right now they're seeing you're guilty. What are they not seeing? The jail that, that awaits you. When they see that jail, then they realize, no, that when I realized I'm guilty, I still didn't realize how serious it was until I saw that jail. There are two levels of realization for criminals. One on judgment day, the other on the day of resurrection. One on judgment day, the other on the day they see, at the end of it when they see hellfire. One of them is kalla sayalamun. The next one is what? Thumma. Kalla sayalamun. And thumma is tarakhi, it's a long time. Thumma doesn't just mean moreover, it actually means then after a long time they'll realize again, oh, wait till, you, wait till they see it again. In this, Allah has basically said to the criminals, you are going to be singing a different tune on Judgment Day. Wait till you see it. Oh boy, and wait till you see what? Hell on top of that. And you'll notice as the surah continues, Allah will first describe Judgment Day, then He'll describe Hellfire. He'll actually Himself do tafsir of kalla sayalamun, and then what? Thumma kalla sayalamun. He'll explain it Himself. Subhanallah. Anyhow, so now quickly I want to get to these ayat. Brief translation first. Alam naj'alil arda mihada. Didn't we make the earth into a bedding, a flooring, something laid out and vast? Wal jibala autada. Didn't we make the mountains into pegs that are deeply rooted into the ground, that don't budge and don't move? وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ azwaja, And we made you into pairs. وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ subata, And we made your sleep into something that cuts you off. When you, basically meaning when you sleep, you're cut off from work, you're cut off from your problems, you're cut off from everything. وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ subata. Okay? And the, the day of Sabbath, Sabbath, right? From the same origin, the Jews were cut off from all their work. And they were cut off from all their business activities. And it, it cut them, right? 
وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا And we made the night into a garment. We made the night into an outfit, clothing. وَجَعَلْنَا النَّهَارَ مَعَاشَ And we made the daytime into a, a time and a means by which you can make a good living and have a good life. وَبَنَيْنَا فَوْقَكُمْ سَبْعًا شدادا. And we raised above you, we built on top of you seven intense, as if to say seven immobile buildings, seven impenetrable buildings. Other places, Qur'an will talk about the skies and say, هَلْ تَرَى مِنْ فُطُورِ Do you see any crack therein? Do you see any opening therein? وَجَعَلْنَا سِرَاجًا وَهَّاجَ And we made a brilliant, constantly blazing heated lamp that lights up over and over and over again. Now I'll stop here for a second and go take a step back. Allah talked about the earth being vast, the mountains being pegs, we are created in pairs, your sleep cuts you off, the night and then the day, so far, right? That's what he's talked about. And then he, he's, he spoke about the, the, you know, the skies and the sun. That's, these are the things that he spoke about. But the language he used is remarkable. The language he used, everything he described, he described something that can be compared to something we do. So for, the, for instance, he said, Alam naj'al al-arda mihada. Didn't we make the earth into a bedding? Who makes bedding? We do. Mihad is also a cradle for a baby. Mahattu al-firash, mahdan, basattuhu, wa watta'atuhu. Yuqalu lil-firash. It's also used for a bed, li withara. So the idea, Allah says, you make a bed, and you make your bed comfortable and compare your bed to the bed I made. Who knows how to make bed, a bed better? Because I made the entire earth into a bed. SubhanAllah. All kinds of creatures sleep on the earth, don't they? And your bed is just a tiny dot on the bed that Allah made. Your bed isn't something special, it's actually just a small piece, a speck on this bedding that Allah created. He made, a, he made a bedding for creatures at the bottom of the ocean floor. That's when he made the earth, earth into a mihad. So it's like, yeah, I know how to make stuff, but no, not like that. Well, jibala autada, he made mountains into pegs. Pegs are used in Arabic, ancient Arabic culture for tents. You know mountains, when you ask a kid, kids, kids to draw a mountain, what does it look like? Tents, doesn't it? You make your tents, Allah says, when I make tents, they look like that. When the wind blows, what happens to your tents? And when the wind blows, what happens to his tents? SubhanAllah. Can you compare your tents to mine? It's reminding the human being of how humble his efforts are and how mighty Allah's creation is. He says, وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ azwaja," And we made you into pairs. You, can, you, did not, you do not exist as a unicellular organism or a unisexual organism. You could not have survived. You could not have existed if it wasn't for a mother and a father coming together. You were created in pairs. You don't have a choice in the matter. You don't get to decide that. There are parts of your being that are just going to remain incomplete unless you're in pairs. There's parts of your existence that will remain unfulfilled until you're in pairs. That's just how, how Allah made you. Even in terms of your spiritual existence, our messenger would say alayhi salatu wasalam that it's half of your deen. It, there's a reason for that. You are not, you can't just say, well I don't need the opposite gender anymore. I don't need to be in pairs. You can't. Azwaj also by the way means groups. Azwaj doesn't just mean pairs, it also means groups. He created you in societies. You can't live on your own. I don't need anybody. Yeah, you kind of do. You kind of do. You will eventually need the help of another human being in something or the other. You can't survive on your own. And people who do, you know how, what happens to them. People who live out in the wilderness by themselves, don't meet anybody. Um, they have the most interesting personalities. <laughs> right? Normally you, you, you are meant to be in society. You're meant to be around others. That's the other meaning of khalaqna kum azwaja. He says he made your sleep into something that cuts you off. You would like to, st you, lo you love life. You would love to stay alive forever and asleep is a kind of death, isn't it? You lost many hours just on that bed. You could have been having fun, you could have been enjoying yourself, you could have been eating, partying, traveling, working, making money, spending money. You can't do any of that because you're what? You're sleeping, you don't have a choice. You can fight it all you want, your body will give up on you and you will die the death of sleep until you're resurrected again. You're incapable. 
He says, you try to cover up your body, you cover your clothes with garments. I cover the entire earth with night. I give that libas to the, night, to the earth. وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا And when I cover it up, you could try to turn your lights on inside, but none of these lights will get rid of the overwhelming darkness of night. وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا وَجَعَلْنَا النَّهَارَ مَعَاشًا I made the morning into a time where earnings can be made. Somebody says, no, 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 I shall farm only at night. Good luck with that. Because what do you need? The animals. What do you need? The sunlight. What do you... All the means by which the, the earth can be sustained are happening in the day. And by the way, even though we say things like the city that never sleeps, right? I used to live in the city that never sleeps. It sleeps. You, you want to go into the city, go after midnight, there's not going to be any traffic. Unless the GW Bridge, then don't go, it's a 24-hour nightmare. But other than that, businesses are closed, Wall Street's closed, the stock market's closed, banks are closed, offices are closed. It's not the same as the daytime. The world over, when is most business happening? During the day. You can't even help it. Try to change it. Try to make it that everybody's sleeping in the day and we only work at night. Yes, there is such a thing as the night shift for people who couldn't find a better job. Right? Yes, time? Okay. So one, one last thing. Two, two more ayat, it'll take one minute. He placed above you seven intense buildings. Seven, you have construction, you look at the ceiling, wow, this is so nice and round. Look at the chandelier, that's so nice. And then Allah says, look at my ceiling. And then he says, in that ceiling, I put a lamp in there, I put a chandelier in there too. And it lights up every day with more and more intense heat. It doesn't, it doesn't burn out. Wahaj actually means it burns, and it burns again, and it burns again, and it burns again, and the heat doesn't go down. Imagine if the sun was giving different levels of heat every day. Well, what happened? To, what kind of destruction would happen on this earth? It's not just that it's a siraj, but it's also what? Wahaj. Wahaj means it keeps on giving the same heat over and over again. Shiddatul hur. You know, that compare your lamp to his. And so the first part of the argument, I haven't finished the argument, the first part of the argument is no, what you make is weak compared to what I make. That's just the first part of the argument and we'll, we'll build on that argument after salah. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim.